Just to give you a very brief taste before we get back to the cognitive part of the panel, I'm going to invite uh, the lead singer of Shorashim, Cantor Magda Fishman, up for a little taste of tonight. So I, I'm put on the spot. I was supposed to think about a song on my way here, and the only song I have in mind is not the Israeli traditional <laughs> song, <laughs> and it's not Hava Nagila. But I was I I had this all week in my mind, and I was just teaching a, a student of mine yesterday, um, the Oaks of Se Shalom. So I hope you can join me on this. But we are doing Israeli fusion mix. He was right. <laughs> Use shalom bimomar, uya se shalom aleinu. Use shalom bimomar, uya se shalom aleinu. Use shalom bimomar, uya se. Shalom aleinu, ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu, ve al kol Yisrael, ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu, ve al kol Yisrael, ya se. Ya se shalom, shalom aleinu ve al kol Yisrael. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu ve al kol yoshvei te. Please join us tonight. I, we, we came all the way from New York, so. That's a Jewish guilt. <laughs> I'll say it. You better come. No, <laughs> you don't want to miss this. Academy Awards can be DVR'd, as you know, as I said last night. Um, so, um, obviously, one of the things we're trying to do is put Kaplan's notion of the broader Jewish civilization uh, into practice here, not just talk about it. But so, that's concerts are very much a part of that. I know it's, it's a little unfair to these guys, because that's a tough act to follow, but you can do it. Um, one is not supposed to have favorite children, and I'm not, certainly not supposed to have a favorite panel. And it's not, um, but it's hard, and it's not because this is a stellar group of presenters, all of them are. Uh, it's because Kaplan, as you know, was an Orthodox ordained rabbi, uh, primarily associated with the conservative movement, uh, the leader of the RA. And the topic, I think, of Kaplan and Reform Judaism has not been enough or in, seriously enough considered uh, in my not so humble opinion. So it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to do that with four amazing leaders of the Reform Movement uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Rabbi Dr. Lance Sussman. He just wanted me quickly to add two items to his biographical materials, which I'm happy to do. Uh, the first is that he is currently teaching at Princeton University beyond his very substantial pulpit responsibilities. And the second, I'm very pleased to say, he is a senior fellow of the Mordechai M. Kaplan Center for Jewish Peoplehood, uh, as is uh, Rabbi Noble, as is Rabbi Beit Halami. <laughs> so it's just some kind of coincidence, I guess. Uh, but um, with that, Rabbi Lance Sussman. Uh, I want to thank Dan for uh, organizing a spectacular conference and for including me and my colleagues. Um, I want to uh, thank Mel Skult. He doesn't know I'm doing this shout out. Um, I met Mel first uh, 30 years ago or so. Uh, I was a grad student at uh, HUC and he was crawling around uh, the archives and uh, he engaged and challenged me then and uh, now uh, with full strength, and uh, I salute you, Mel, for a, a wonderful life of scholarship and friendship. Thank you. Um, as I, thank you. Uh, as I said, I, I trained at HUC Cincinnati both for uh, the rabbinate and my, uh, my doctoral work. My uh, principal advisor was uh, Jacob R. Marcus, who may or may not be familiar to you outside of the reform 
uh, movement, uh, in addition to being really the founder of the field of American uh, Jewish history, uh, he was a staunch reform patriot. I don't think I ever met a more patriotic reform Jew than Dr. Jacob R. Marcus. Uh, you can imagine my surprise to me uh, when one day uh, after a tutorial he said to me, you know, Lance, we're all Reconstructionists. Uh, I actually had encountered uh, Mordechai Kaplan, uh, but didn't know it, uh, as a confirmation student in uh, Baltimore in a big reform synagogue in 1969. Uh, our confirmation textbook was called Wings of the Morning, written by Roland Gittleson, who I can only describe you now, after knowing a little bit more than I did then, that he was actually a Reconstructionist Murano walking around in reform clothing. So uh, then you could imagine, uh, about three years after uh, confirmation, I found myself in college and in an intro to religion course, uh, read snippets from uh, Judaism as a Civilization, uh, yarmulke on to anybody who reads the whole uh, text. And uh, there were some uh, pretty stinging passages in there uh, about uh, Reform Judaism, which at the time uh, I wasn't really prepared for, and I uh, obviously was talking about uh, a certain species of reform, kind of the uh, classical Cincinnati reform, uh, as opposed to what might have followed uh, later. And in fact, uh, I know that this was referenced the other way around, but I think Judaism as a civilization uh, had a profound uh, effect uh, on the reform movement. Three years after uh, it was uh, published, uh, we have our own Columbus platform, which is embraces uh, this concept of, of peoplehood, which becomes the basis uh, for what we call uh, neo-reform. So uh, indeed, uh, it went from, uh, uh, Kaplan went from a, a position that might have been uh, instinctively hostile uh, to actually a kind of, uh, of partner. Uh, and then lastly, in my um, preface to uh, the real work of the, um, of the panel here, uh, the synagogue uh, that I serve, uh, Knesset Israel, uh, is exactly one mile from the Reconstructionist Rabbinic uh, College. Uh, we often serve as a kind of laboratory for RRC uh, students. We have uh, some of the uh, best informed second grade teachers anywhere uh, in the United States. Uh, and I particularly enjoy being shadowed uh, by RRC uh, students. Um, uh, we also enjoy uh, being uh, very often the venue for a graduation and other uh, large group exercises for uh, RRC. So uh, both geographically and in terms of uh, uh, sentiment, I feel very close uh, to uh, the movement, and it's my own hope that occasions like this will uh, draw us uh, even closer together, religiously, philosophically, sociologically. Uh, our movement also needs the challenges and affirmations of Mordechai Kaplan. Uh, to help us better understand, uh, we have a distinguished panel of three doctor uh, rabbis, a special title, uh, reform movement uh, was uh, particularly proud of uh, 100 years ago, but we all uh, insist on carrying it around. Um, going in order from my left, um, uh, David Ellenson now holds the most coveted job in the reform movement, the immediate past president of the Hebrew <laughs> Union College. For all and Rachel Sabbath Bet Halachmi uh, is the presidential scholar uh, at uh, HUC. And Peter Noble uh, has been not only a congregational rabbi in Chicago, now in Florida, but president of our uh, CCAR uh, and a, a major presence uh, in the religious life uh, of the rabbinate, the reform rabbinate, and of our movement. Uh, David will be speaking about hermeneutics. Uh, Rachel will be speaking uh, about the uh, relationship of Kaplan and Eugene Borowitz in our own movement, and uh, Peter will uh, be the third speaker talking about folkways and mitzvot. David Ellenson. I want to thank Lance for that uh, extremely warm introduction. I could not help but observe or glance out that, as you said, I hold the best title uh, 
in the movement, immediate past president, I looked at my friend, Rabbi Dr. Deborah Waxman, and uh, <laughs> offer her my warmest congratulations. <laughs> and I would only add that this movement is genuinely blessed uh, to have you uh, as its leader at this time. Deborah, as all of you know, is a person of great wisdom, knowledge, uh, caring, vision, and most of all, I would say, in light of my own interactions with her, warmth. Uh, she met with me on a couple of occasions, more than one or two, prior to her becoming president of the RRC. And uh, I'm glad to say that nothing I said deterred her from <laughs> this aliyah in her life. But I wish you Mishat Tovah Mutzlachat, really only good and wonderful uh, achievement as you uh, come to serve in this new capacity. I'm also very happy to be here to have heard Mel Skold, Susanna Heschel, Zachary, uh, Rabbi Gluck, uh, and Deborah earlier. All of your comments are in my brain right now, and it may be that there'll be comments uh, both here in the paper and uh, later on that will reflect some of my own absorption of what uh, some of the comments were that they made in their uh, talks today. I'd also thank Daniel for inviting me and Lance to be on this panel and express special thanks to my friend, uh, Dr. Yoka Yehoyada Amir, who'll be chairing a panel yesterday. It was he who about four months ago mentioned there was going to be a conference on Kaplan would you in fact like to participate? And I said, absolutely. Uh, and I think it was really due to Yoki that I was invited uh, here today. One last confession. Um, I have said this on many occasions and Rachel Shabbat Beit Talachmi said, are you going to make this comment today? Before Jacob Rader Marcus, or at least I knew he made that comment, I would add too that I think I am genuinely a reconstructionist, uh, but I am, I will confess, as I've said to Deborah, an unreconstructed reconstructionist. Uh, David Teutsch, who was my classmate at Hebrew Union College, I often felt, particularly after Kol Shama, the reconstructionist Sidur came out, writing a letter or two, I often received letters from classical reform Jews complaining about the Zionist shift in the reform movement. Uh, I was going to be the person who was going to write to my friends Art Green and David Teutsch and note what would Kaplan genuinely have said about some of the ways in which Reconstructionism has evolved in our day. And I never did write the letter, but in conversations they simply said, not focusing on peoplehood, but they added that Judaism is an evolving religious civilization, and he would have applauded some of these uh, changes. And I promise you, Deborah, no letter of that type. <laughs> I've decided to entitle my talk, uh, History, Continuity, and Interpretation, Thoughts on Mordecai Kaplan and Reform Judaism that were occasioned by my reading of an article, Mordecai Kaplan is Hermanut, by Professor uh, Leora Batnitsky of Princeton University. I had, a week ago, thought I was going to be doing a different paper, but after I read Leora's paper, I decided to move in this other direction. In his 1965 book, The Historian and the Believer, the Protestant scholar of religion Van Harvey observed that the commitment of the modern historian to a sustained and critical attempt to recover the past was motivated or is motivated by a Promethean will to truth that was genuinely revolutionary when this approach first fully manifested itself during the 19th century. He observed that traditional belief based on supernatural metaphysics, uh, he observed that modern historical method, I'm sorry, was based on naturalistic assumptions quite irreconcilable with traditional belief based on supernatural metaphysics and went on to assert, if the theologian believes on faith that certain events as recorded in Holy Writ occurred, the historian regards all historical claims as having only a greater or lesser degree of probability and he regards the attachment of faith to these claims as a corruption of historical judgment. 
The modern study of history with its critical canons of scholarship and its dogmatic notions of change is thus by definition seemingly antithetical to faith as Kierkegaard, the famed 19th century Protestant theologian phrased it, one can know nothing at all about Christ. He is the paradox, the object of faith, existing only for faith, but all historical communication is communication of knowledge. Hence, from history, one can learn nothing at all about Christ. He can only be believed. All this may seem an unusual place to begin this presentation on an aspect of the relationship between Mordecai Kaplan and Reform Judaism. After all, our topic today is not Christianity. However, my citations of Professor Harvey and Soren Kierkegaard are meant to indicate that the question about the relationship between the modern study of history and the matter of religious faith, of how to reconcile adherence to a sacred tradition with critical methods of historical research, has plagued many religious believers, not just Jewish ones, during the last 200 years. In the Jewish world, the late professor at Columbia, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, in his deservedly famous Zachor, echoed the positions of Harvey and Kierkegaard and phrased the dilemma in the following way. The discovery of history by the Jewish historian is not a mere interest in the past, which always existed, but it's a new awareness, a perception of a fluid temporal dimension from which nothing is exempt. The major consequence for Jewish historiography is that it cannot view Judaism as something absolutely given and subject to a priori definition. Judaism is inseparable from its evolution through time. And of course, it is important to note that all non-Orthodox movements in Judaism are based on this assumption. It is therefore a small wonder that many Jewish religious traditionalists have vehemently protested the critical works of modern scholarship for these works support, as Yerushalmi once more phrases it, a Jewish historiography divorced from Jewish collective memory and in crucial respects thoroughly at odds with it. With it. The study of modern history is seemingly a subversive act for Jewish faith. Yet modern historical scholarship has not always been at odds with the construction of Jewish memory and faith. While this mode of investigation clearly can be employed to undermine tradition, the method of Wissenschaft has just as surely been utilized to construct new ways of approaching Jewish commitment and faith. In fact, during the 19th century in Germany, historical scholarship frequently played the role of handmaiden to religion, and its influence was pervasive in virtually every precinct of German Jewish life, and of course, all the modernist movements in Judaism, reform, conservative, reconstructionist, are all based on this kind of an approach. As Ismar Shorish observed, and I won't go through the whole quote, Wissenschaftlich history is programmatic history. The programmatic aims of the historical study of Jewish tradition <clears throat> were nowhere more pronounced than among the leaders of the reform movement and liberal Judaism in the 19th century when Rabbi Samuel Holdheim, who lived from 1806 to 1860, the most radical reform rabbi in Germany, wrote, the Talmud speaks with the ideology of its time. For its time, it was right. I speak from the higher ideology of my time, and for my time, I am right. Or when Zachariah Frankel observed, I stand for a positive historical Judaism. In order to understand Judaism in the present, one must look back and investigate its past. Both men, however different their position on the nature of Judaism and the binding character of Jewish law, established their stances on the basis of their reading of history. Similarly, the men who headed the two major reform rabbinical schools of the 19th century, Abraham Geiger, who was mentioned earlier today, of the Berlin Hochschule and Isaac Merweis of HUC, went to great lengths to include courses in history of the curricula of their institutions, courses that displayed the ongoing nature of development and change, as well as variety and pluralism in the ongoing story of Judaism. In this way, they were able to claim historical warrant for their own efforts at religious adaptation and change, 
and they were able to claim that their own contemporary versions of the tradition represented, and this will be a major point I want to emphasize, a genuine continuity with the Jewish past, a Jewish past that was constantly evolving. To paraphrase the insight of Dr. Shorish, history became the medium, the way in which Judaism would come to be explained to Jews in the modern world, as well as the authority, the foundation, for these men in their own attempts at religious reform. I would now turn to Kaplan himself in a highly insightful and suggestive essay, Mordechai Kaplan as Hermanut, in which Leora of Batnitsky of Princeton points to this distinctive use of history for Kaplan's own program of Jewish reconstruction. Quoting Jacob Staub, the former dean of the RRC, Batnitsky begins by conceding that Kaplan's God idea, now I quote, is different from much, if not all, of ancient, medieval, or modern Jewish thought. However, Batnitsky contends, the difference is not metaphysical, nor is it even philosophical. Rather, the difference is hermeneutical, and I'll explain what she means by that in one moment. Batnitsky explains this uniqueness resides not in Kaplan's claim that God is the power that makes for salvation, nor does it lie in his rejection of supernaturalism. Rather, Kaplan is unique, Batnitsky avers, because Kaplan reads Jewish history to make, and now I quote, the absolutely explicit claim that his God idea and his theology is a break with the past. Batnitsky then turns to a book that's been cited often today, The Meaning of God in Modern Jewish Religion, where Kaplan adumbrates his two well-known methods, his two well-known approaches to Jewish text. One he labels transvaluation, while the other is defined as revaluation. Transvaluation represents the projections of the beliefs and values of a current generation into the writings of the teachers and sages of an earlier period, what might be commonly referred to as eisegesis. Both the sense of national continuity and the faith and divine origin of the religious tradition make trans, made transvaluation seem perfectly plausible for past generations. But the method of transvaluation cannot do that for the modern Jew. The very use of it implies that those who resort to it are themselves unaware that they are adjusting or reconstructing tradition to meet the needs of their own day. When I quote Kaplan here, I do remember when I was a first year rabbinical student, Dr. Kaplan was living in Israel at the time and he taught a class to our first year students in Jerusalem and I will never forget he began the class or concluded it by asking us to translate the line, Hashivenu Adonai Elecha V'nashuva, Chadesh Yamenu Kekedem, he asked us how do you translate that? Cause us to return to you, O oh God, uh, and we will return, renew our days as of old. And the 91-year-old Dr. Kaplan went, reconstruct our days as of old. <laughs> the translation, the transition from traditional Judaism to the Judaism of the future can be affected only in the glaring light of complete awareness of the change involved. Kaplan asserts there is an explicit break theologically with the Jewish past. Bas Batnitsky comments, many modern Jewish thinkers, and this would include the reform thinkers we mentioned above, continue to think that they can fit into the model of transvaluation. But Kaplan maintains that this is not possible, precisely because of the modern awareness, whether it is acknowledged or not, of a break with the past. To be sure, Batnitsky correctly observes that this distinction between transvaluation and revaluation may well be a false dichotomy. After all, our modern historical consciousness makes us aware of the difference between past and presence. To turn to, in the words of Ricoeur, a second naivete, as a colleague and teacher like Neil Gilman does, may not be enough to meet, and this is what I want to emphasize, the epistemological challenge that makes such claims for continuity with the past and authority in the present suspect. 
Nevertheless, Batnitsky points out that the distinction is real for Kaplan, and he is able to make the claim that the essential feature of Jewish tradition it's, is its continual interpretive process. That is what Dr. Kaplan asserts is the ongoing permanent part of Judaism, its ongoing interpretive process, because there is, Batnitsky claims, an historicist strand in Kaplan that was provided by the context of the conservative movement and the Jewish Theological Seminary. While Wissenschaft, the academic study of the past, provides a negative outcome for traditional Jewish theology by pointing to the implausible, I'm trying to put this as nicely as I can, implausible theological assumptions in which Torah is grounded. However, modern historical study is not only epistemologically significant, but hermeneutically significant because history discloses that a constant hermeneutical enterprise marks Judaism. Understood in this way, revaluation provides for a seamless continuity with the tradition. Discontinuity with the past is proclaimed in the meaning of God in modern Jewish religion. Kaplan writes, religion can no longer be a matter of entering into relationship with the supernatural. At the same time, continuity is infirmed through the interpretive process, history, and what history reveals, a kind of historicism legitimates a modern reconstructionism no less than it does reform. Batnitsky also observes that Rosenzweig made precisely the same type of argument that Kaplan did. I don't know how much the timing, oh boy, okay. I'll just say for Rosenzweig, transvaluation and revaluation would be one. While Kaplan might not agree with this identification, this should not obscure the parallels between the stances of the great liberal German Jewish religious thinker and the American founder of Reconstructionism. Each proclaims Jewish continuity with the past because of the continuing vitality of Jewish interpretation. In closing, and I don't really have the time to go through this now, I would note that Kaplan's writings are paralleled very closely by the writings of Shimon Ravidovich, who was the first head of the Negus Department at Brandeis University. Professor Ravi Dovich wrote a work on interpretation, and basically the claim that Professor Ravi Dovich makes is that Breshit bara Yisrael, in the beginning Israel created. There is text, and there is a rabbinic tradition of what he calls Bayit Sheni, the rabbinic period, in which interpretation is the task of the Jewish person. Interpretation, and the ongoing hermeneutical process in Judaism is what makes for an authentic Judaism. Ravi Dovich attacks Spinoza savagely because Spinoza wants to assert that there can be no interpretive process in Judaism today because classically the interpretive process in a pre-modern period rested on the notion that these texts were not arbitrarily chosen, nor were they simply sociologically affirmed by a community that gave a community a sense of identity, but rather they were epistemologically confirmed and seen as metaphysically significant because they were regarded as the products of revelation. In a world where one can no longer make those sorts of metaphysical affirmations and therefore the epistemological claims that flow from them, one would have to ask, I think, both Rabbi Kaplan and Professor Ravi Dovich on what grounds one continues to make this kind of affirmation. To paraphrase the words of President Waxman, while Rosenzweig said, and he was probably correct in a thick Jewish culture, that ever since the time of Mendelssohn, Judaism has rested on this terrible question of why, namely, why is it that one ought to be Jewish in a world that Dr. Kaplan grew up in and even a Rosenzweig, where being Jewish was a matter not only of choice, but I would argue to some degree of fate, where people lived in a thick Jewish culture. Rosenzweig could say what he did and Kaplan could basically ignore this element of the epistemological question in regard to interpretation, along with reform and other counterparts, in a way that perhaps we do not have the luxury to do today.
That is a challenge to Rabbi Kaplan. It is a challenge to the reform movement. It is a challenge to all of liberal Judaism. Thank you. Now we just have to figure it out. <laughs> Well, now that we've stated the problem, <laughs> well, you're gonna answer it I'm going to, well, I'm, I'm uh, very honored to be here to offer an answer actually to a number of the challenges that have <coughs> been raised today. But first, I want to say uh, thank you to Dan Cederbaum uh, and particularly to Mel Skult, who's been such a great teacher and Chavruta on Kaplan for many years, and of course to Rabbi Professor David Ellenson. Uh, without whom I don't think I would have written my doctorate on uh, Eugene Borowitz. And I also uh, want to actually thank my husband, Rabbi Ofer Sabbath Beit Alachmi, who for the last 10 years as an Israeli rabbi ordained by our school in Jerusalem, uh, has been uh, teaching Kaplan in all of the Hebrew translations of Kaplan in Israel, and I've been watching and learning how deeply, not only Zionist for sure, Kaplan was, but how very rich Kaplan's teachings have been for Judaism and Israel, a topic that we'll address in greater detail tomorrow. Uh, but I certainly want to thank, uh, uh, thank all of these people that I just named for what you've taught me about Kaplan. But in terms of my intellectual wrestling and my own development, um, it's really Rabbi Professor David Hartman, Zichron Olivracha, who we just commemorated his first yard site, and Rabbi Professor Eugene Borwitz, who just celebrated his 90th birthday, um, with whom I have wrestled about Kaplan for a number of decades. And I found myself uh, in both instances, both with Hartman and with Borowitz, I have often found myself taking Kaplan's side of the argument, uh, and perhaps we can address that uh, further as we move through this discussion. Today, I am focusing particularly on how Rabbi Professor Eugene Borowitz understood and critiqued Mordechai Kaplan. I think of all the thinkers that Borowitz had evaluated and took into consideration in the development of his own system and his own theology, while he was very, very critical of all of them, I think it was clearly Kaplan that he appreciated in terms of appreciating the sheer intellectual creative effort of Kaplan's work. He appreciated Kaplan more than any other thinker, perhaps with the exception only of Martin Buber. Kaplan and Borowitz certainly shared a great deal, but in order to play this out, I think I might need in this context to share a little bit more about Borowitz for those of you who may not be familiar with all 19 of his books. <laughs> so just in case there might be someone who uh, isn't particularly familiar with uh, perhaps his main theological work, Renewing the Covenant, a theology for the postmodern Jew, which was just translated and came out uh, in large part thanks to Professor Yoki Amir, uh, just came out last week in Hebrew. Um, so he's joined Kaplan in terms of being translated into the Israeli landscape. But Borowitz is, uh, among his 19 uh, books, which span the works on Talmud and ethics, uh, he focused primarily on liberal theology and on the creation of a liberal theology that he thought should be able to correct for all the problems of the theologians that had gone before him. Very much like Kaplan, he believed that we live in a context now in North America that demanded absolutely demanded a new theology. So Borowitz, together with Hartman, together with Yitz Greenberg, together with Emil Fackenheim and many others, gathered uh, for a number of years and began to think about what new theology was needed for the American landscape after the war. Borowitz was the first, in fact, to publish and coin the term covenant theology, published in Commentary Magazine in an essay in 1960. 61, and that uh, term of covenant theology actually included in it, in the years that followed, three major components. First and foremost, and now you'll begin to hear the critique, first and foremost for Borowitz is God. 
the Jewish self, Borowitz's central term, the Jewish self lives personally and primarily with the one God of the universe. And he begins to play out already in the 1960s, but very much so, much more so in the 1980s and 90s, an understanding of a autonomous Jewish self who lives in relation with three major entities. One, a God that is commanding, demanding, to whom we are duty bound to respond. You can already begin to hear what the critique will be. The second entity is the Jewish people. You will begin to hear what I think is an enormous impact on Borowitz of Kaplan. Any decision that a Jew makes today, a non-Orthodox Jew to makes, has to be not only in response to that one God of the universe, but in response to the Jewish people, past, present, and future. And third, but not foremost, but absolutely present, was Borowitz's sense of the Jewish self. That in an age of modernity and what he already saw as an age of post-secular, post-modernity, he knew that the Jewish self was going to have to have full autonomy. But as we come to understand Borowitz, it is a limited autonomy. A limited autonomy, and you'll already see that as another source of critique. But Borowitz, when I met with him a couple of days ago in New York, he said to me about Kaplan that he thought that Kaplan was an extremely intelligent and important and creative thinker, but when it came to God, he was simply wrong. <laughs> How so? Let's try to understand it. The two men, of course, share very much. They both had the spirit of this Wissenschaftian approach to Judaism and Jewish studies and Jewish texts. They both stood on the shoulders of the giants of modern thought, and particularly that of Hermann Cohen. We'll hear about that more tomorrow. And I think, although they didn't state it, they both felt an enormous responsibility to respond in a post-Holocaust context and believed that American Jewry had the responsibility had the responsibility to be creative theologically and Jewishly in a way that could possibly do justice to what America and democracy and pluralism might allow us to be with an enormous sense, I believe, of a, of a guilt of that which had been lost in Europe and that which they strove to begin to be able to honor. Unlike what Dr. Skult said earlier about Heschel and Kaplan, Borowitz read Kaplan very, very carefully, and I think to a great degree understood Kaplan very, very well, and he understood Kaplan's struggle and Kaplan's problem, but already even the young Borowitz in 1957 is enormously critical of Kaplan. There are uh, probably three major stages in Borowitz's thought and response to Kaplan, which all of which we won't be able to fully address today, uh, but I want to share with you some of the stages. So in this first stage in a paper that he uh, actually originally delivered to the CCAR, he writes that Kaplan, ref his problem with Kaplan, we'll see, is that while Kaplan refers to God in the singular, quote, the power as such as a single entity, has no individual existence. It is merely a singular usage. The unity of God means only the oneness my mind imposes on the diverse natural forces which make for salvation. But if God, insofar as he is objectively real, refers to what are but fragmentary forces of the universe, whence did these come? And what is their relation to those other forces which exist about us and which do not make for salvation? Borowitz continues, if God as a unity is the creation of my needs and my imagination, how can I know that he is as real in the world as he is to my mind? Where will I find the certainty which alone will make me act that he is indeed dominant in the universe? Why should I do his bidding against much of my will when I know that his will is but another part of mine? 
To me, too, it is a contradiction in terms, writes Borowitz, or at least an enormous paradox that a power or a process should make for moral ends. The term power and process are useful precisely because they are natural, that is objective, impersonal, mechanical. But moral ends are inevitably tied up with personality, with freedom and of choice, and will, will and choice. If God, insofar as he is an objective reality, is somehow personal, we can understand how he can make for a salvation which is intimately personal. But what is real in the universe in this idea of God are natural forces or processes which are by definition impersonal. How then can we understand them as making for moral ends and stake our whole existence on the outcome? You see the problem that Borowitz is identifying and that many critiqued in Kaplan, how can we find this idea of God that is so dependent on the self's understanding of God as that which can actually bind us or bound us in any way and be our ground for meaning, our ground for morality. In a sense, Borowitz is becoming postmodern, before he even used that term, Borowitz is becoming modern and gives a postmodern critique of Kaplan's embrace of, human, of hu the human understanding of modernity. But finally, just in case you want to know how Borowitz really feels about <laughs> Kaplan, listen to this. I find I cannot pray to this God, particularly in the language of the tradition. Shall I address forces that I cannot hear? Shall I speak to myself and my ideas about the universe and call this prayer? I cannot even say a simple blessing, like the one for the Hanukkah candles. When my mind, without which I cannot pray, understands by the Hebrew words, are you ready? Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshan v'mitzvotav v'tzivanu lahad likner shel Chanukah. Here's Borowitz's interpretation of what Kaplan must mean when he says such a bracha. I acknowledge, listen carefully, this is instead of Baruch atah, Hashem. I acknowledge those processes in the universe which make for my highest fulfillment, which predominate in it, and to which our people has been devoted, thereby creating activities which help the individual and group achieve self-fulfillment, one of which, ennobling activities, is to kindle these Hanukkah candles. Amen. <laughs> but in 1957, Eugene Borowitz says boldly, to this, I cannot say amen. <laughs> you see the deep, deep divide between Kaplanian theology and what I'm going to call in this period, for Borowitz's period, reform theology. Now fortunately, if we were to uh, address this issue in a much larger way, in a much larger way, we know that Borowitz Thankfully, in the next stage of his writings, also addresses Kaplan's theory of evil. You can see and imagine how they might agree and disagree there. Actually, neither of them focused on the Holocaust, and neither of them saw a need for a major theological shift. They both, uh, Borowitz also critiques, as you heard, uh, Kaplan's notion of prayer. You heard a great example of that. Uh, Borowitz was very disturbed by Kaplanian notions of chosenness and yet he appreciated them and he knew, because both men are very much pragmatists at the end of the day. He understood and appreciated what Kaplan was trying to do, even though he disagrees with it. And finally, of course, Jewish law. Kaplan, he says, in that second stage, uh, Kaplan considered peoplehood to be the only eternal aspect of Judaism. Modern historical research had made it undeniable that Jewish law could no longer be seen as Sinaitically revealed. It must rather be understood as the folk's creative effort to institutionalize its ethos and give it historic, to give it historical staying power. It ought to serve the needs of the Jewish people and not vice versa. So his, one of Borowitz's main problems with Kaplan, of course, one of the great critiques is that Jewish law and lore and religion are not meant, and ideas of God are not meant to serve people, 
but actually Borowitz is very much traditional in the sense that he believes, and very Buberian and Heschelanian, if you will, believes that the Jewish people and the individual self is still meant to serve God and to serve the Jewish people past, present, and future. I'll just uh, skip over, over a number of other items that we might address, but I'll say that what Borowitz found fascinating was the recent reconstructionist involvement with mysticism. So he's appreciating also a Kaufmanian uh, um, critique and, uh, and reinterpretation of Kaplan, but he also sees that what happened in recent years, by the time we get to his third stage of thought, Borowitz's third stage of thought, he appreciates the reconstructionist involvement with mysticism, which Kaplan would have denounced as supernaturalism. I see in it a more typically postmodern effort than Kaufman's to provide a plausibility structure for Kaplan's esteem of culture. Whether we agree to, this is Borowitz, whether we agree to undertake the metaphysical project or not, the issue of a foundation or ground for a system of obligation cannot be ignored without turning duty into option and thus vitiating the system's effect. Borowitz writes, the way out of Kaplan's dilemma lies in identifying a level of reality that does not share the disabilities of the clashing alternatives, namely transcendence. I think enough can be said about the nature of transcendence to indicate why I find it the preferable metaphor, the preferable metaphor in speaking about our ground of value. And finally, in a day when liberal Judaism and Zionism seemed intellectually incomprehensible, Kaplan, says Borowitz, found a way to combine a strong Jewish ethnicity with a fully universal faith. In a troubled and confused time, Mordechai Kaplan had the daring and capacity to confront his people's problems realistically and to propose solutions for decades he challenged the will and the intelligence of all who cared about Jewish life. His unique combination of Jewish heart and mind remains a spur and a challenge to all succeeding Jewish thinkers. Borowitz teaches us that history is the laboratory of Jewish theology. This is why he writes, reason has never triumphed over life in our religion. This is why Judaism at its best has not been afraid of the freedom of the Agadah or the discipline of the Halakha. <clears throat> it has held, it has them yoked in a dynamic tension which keeps them both alive. And it relies on the experiences of history to lead them both closer to the truth. <coughs> In conclusion, it wasn't that Borowitz was against Kaplan's primacy of Jewish peoplehood. We find it central to Borowitz's theology, to be sure. It wasn't that Borowitz disagreed with Kaplan's Zionist excitement, because Jean, too, was and is a Zionist, although in a very different way. But rather, it was the missing element of that personal, supernatural, commanding, <coughs> Excuse me. And demanding God. <coughs> Borowitz sought, well, I'm losing my voice, I apologize. Borowitz sought to correct Kaplan's brave and creative work. And now the next generation, all of us, must correct for those corrections. <laughs> I too would like to um, offer my personal thanks to Dan Cederbaum, who I have the privilege of studying with uh, every week, and uh, to thank my incredible colleagues on this panel uh, who 
just to be in their presence is a learning experience, and once again, I've learned so much from them. I want to begin uh, also with a personal anecdote. Uh, I had the privilege of succeeding Rabbi David Polish of blessed memory, and uh, David and I had a very interesting conversation in which he told me that Mordecai Kaplan had invited him uh, to join the Reconstructionist movement, that David had, in fact, agonized over it and eventually decided not to do it. So I thought the paper that I would give today would be on David Polish and Mordecai Kaplan. Um, then I discovered uh, that uh, in David's memoirs, there is no mention of Mordecai Kaplan. Uh, secondly, that at least the Hebrew Union College uh, has no letters between uh, David Polish and Mordecai Kaplan. And um, at that point, I sort of gave up uh, because the diaries of Mordecai Kaplan are not yet searchable. Uh, so I decided uh, that I would uh, speak on uh, the concept of mitzvah and uh, folkways, uh, but I want to add one other uh, thing, uh, and that was um, I'm at a little disadvantage. I'm in uh, Carl Gables, Florida. I know you all feel very sorry for me, uh, but that uh, uh, puts yes, that puts me um, very far from my own library. Uh, so one of the things that was interesting to me was that um, when I went to the synagogue library, uh, there was no copy of any of Kaplan's works. Then, much to my surprise, when I asked my two colleagues uh, who are graduates of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, uh, whether they had any of Kaplan's books, I discovered they did not have any of Kaplan's books. Uh, so that was really, uh, it's anecdotal, but uh, really very, very interesting. Uh, when I was at the Hebrew Union College in the middle and late 60s, uh, Kaplan and Kaplan's thought was very, very important. I remember reading um, Judaism as a Civilization, and I own uh, most of uh, Kaplan's uh, other works. Uh, so Kaplan has been important in many ways in my own thought and uh, in uh, the kinds of things that I have been involved in within the Reform Movement. Uh, as many of you uh, perhaps know from reading my um, brief biography, I've been involved in the creation of uh, guides uh, for reform practice and been very much involved in the uh, development of the most recent uh, edition of the Reform Sidur, uh, Mishkan Tefillah. Uh, I'm going to uh, engage in something uh, which my uh, late teacher, uh, Rabbi Sam Sandmel, uh, described as parallelomania. Um, he uh, defined it as follows. We might, for our purposes, define parallelomania as the extravagance among scholars, which first overdoes the imposed similarity in passages, and then proceeds to describe source and derivation if, Im if implying literary connection flowing in an inevitable or predetermined direction. Uh, what, that, what that basically means is I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, development of ritual and prayer books within the reform movement, and I'm going to suggest uh, that there are parallels uh, between uh, Kaplan and the Reform Movement, but at the same time, uh, in most cases, I cannot prove uh, direct uh, influence. Uh, it has already been mentioned uh, that uh, the Columbus Platform of 1938 is, in fact, very important and revolutionary. Uh, Michael Meyer, in his book, uh, Response to Modernity, argues the direct influence of Kaplan, uh, both from the point of view of uh, religious practice and also from the point of view of uh, restoration of Jewish peoplehood. Uh, in addition, um, Michael Meyer indicates, and uh, I think this is very important, that in 1968, with the opening of the uh, Reconstructionist Rabbinical Seminary, uh, the Hebrew Union College uh, felt a necessity to change its own curriculum, uh, that it established its first year in Israel program, which I would argue in many ways has transformed uh, reform practice. And in addition, uh, it um, gave uh, students a greater uh, a role in uh, the life of the religious life of the Hebrew Union College. I was at the Hebrew Union College in the uh, final death throes of classical reform Judaism. Uh, one was not permitted to wear a kippah or a talit. Uh, this was a moment of great tension within the context of the uh, Hebrew Union College, and this would uh, definitively break down over the next uh, few years. Um, 
at the Hebrew Union College, uh, Kaplan's notion of Judaism as a civilization uh, was already, for many of us, very well established. Although I would argue, in many ways, it was established in a kind of oversimplified and superficial way. Uh, but in point of fact, what we did know, we did come to recognize that what had been uh, the notion of Reform Judaism, as enshrined in the Pittsburgh Platform of 1885, which was uh, uh, Judaism as religion, uh, did not really speak to us anymore, that we needed to uh, have a more comprehensive understanding of the history and development of Judaism, uh, and that included both ethnicity and theology. Now, it is important for us to note that in the 1960s and in a number of years following, uh, that what was most important in the reform movement, and I think was important to Kaplan, uh, was uh, intellectual honesty. Uh, and therefore, theology and Jewish thought was particularly important at that period of time. Uh, so if you take a look at, uh, for example, a Gates of Prayer, which is published in about 1974, you'll discover that there are 10 uh, services. There are 10 services, each representing a separate theology. Uh, there was this notion of the need to revitalize, as Kaplan would have said, uh, Jewish life, uh, but it had to be done intellectually honestly, and therefore we thought if we created this anthology of services, somehow Jews would flock back to the synagogue. Didn't happen. Uh, but in point of fact, it was, in my view, uh, in part, not specifically Kaplan's theology, but in part uh, the influence of Kaplan's notion of revitalization and the importance of intellectual honesty that uh, underlay uh, the ethos that created uh, 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 Gates of Prayer. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Mishkan on Tefillah, uh, which is our latest prayer book, uh, no longer has uh, multiple services. It has a two-page spread in which uh, we have variety of theologies on the same page. It was actually very much influenced uh, by David Teutsch, uh, who was the editor of Kol HaNishama in conversations that I had with him. But in addition, it suggested a much more holistic approach uh, to Judaism and Jewish thought. Uh, but one of the things that was very important in the development of Mishkan uh, Tefillah was uh, a theology of human adequacy. Uh, in other words, as uh, Kaplan wanted us not to see a supernatural dominating God, there were many people within the context of the reform movement who wanted to have humankind affirmed as having a real role. That the previous prayer books of the reform movement largely portrayed God not only in a theistic manner, but in a theistic absolutist manner in which uh, uh, human beings uh, did not see themselves truly as God's partner, truly as having a strong constructive uh, role. Uh, Kaplan uh, defined uh, mitzvot in a new way, and in a radically new way, as all of you know. Uh, he wrote in um, Judaism as a Civilization, if we therefore uh, designate all commandments pertaining to the relations between man and God as minhagim, or folkways, uh, we would accomplish a twofold purpose. First, we would convey the thought that they should not uh, be dealt with in a legalistic spirit, a spirit which gives rise to quibbling and petty fogging. Uh, they should be dealt with as the very stuff of Jewish life, which should be experienced with spontaneity, joy, and which can be modified as circumstances require. Uh, second, uh, we would convey the implication that uh, not only uh, should as many uh, commandments uh, in uh, quotation marks or folkways as possible be retained and developed, but that Jewish life should be stimulated to evolve new and additional folkways. Folkways are the social practices by which a people externalizes the reality of collective being. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, history of uh, the reform movement, and if you take a look at uh, Kaplan's uh, further notion uh, that if we are to use the word mitzvah, uh, we are to use it as a metaphor. Uh, he described uh, the mitzvah as poetry in action. Uh, you will discover that starting in around uh, 1944, uh, the late uh, Rabbi Solomon uh, Freehoff uh, began a project uh, which he called Reform Jewish Practice and its rabbinic background. He argued um, 
the foundation of Jewish religious life is Jewish practice upon which are built the habits of mind and attitudes toward the universe. First, we obey God's commandments, and then we learn to understand God's nature. We do not begin with theology, we arrive at theology. Uh, at the same time, in, in what seems to be a very theistic uh, notion, uh, he indicated not that we were going to return to halakha, but that actually we were going to return to minhag. Uh, that, in point of fact, reform had already begun to de develop uh, minhagim, uh, including the late Friday night service, uh, confirmation, etc. And Freehoff embarked on what uh, became a decades-long endeavor to link reform Jewish practice with traditional customs, providing with historical roots, pointing out similarities, differences, and, ex and encouraging experimentation. Uh, in the late 1930s, there were some attempts uh, through the Union uh, for American Hebrew Congregations to develop guides for practice, uh, but the next most important attempt was in 1957 uh, by Rabbi David Polish and Rabbi Fred Doppelt, who created a, uh, a guide for Reform Jews. Uh, interestingly enough, this was so controversial that the reform movement refused to publish it, and thanks to uh, Fred Doppelt, who uh, was related to the Dopp Kit, uh, they were able to get the book uh, published uh, pr uh, privately. Uh, but where, but po Polish and Doppelt began to use uh, the word mitzvah, uh, and, but they began to understand the word mitzvah as a reacting to spiritual moments in Jewish history when the people came uh, upon God. Now, uh, it, the language sounds, I think, in some ways very uh, theistic, but in point of fact, I would argue that uh, Polish, having been uh, influenced uh, by Kaplan and influenced in Kaplan, both in areas of Zionism and in uh, theology, uh, would understand this in a kind of non-theistic uh, uh, commanding way, that somehow uh, history uh, imposes upon us uh, uh, practices and helps us identify with the Jewish people. So, for example, Doppelt Polish um, uh, make their guide distinctly reform, uh, and they uh, uh, already enshrine in there uh, as obligatory, and this is a, a particular problem with the way in which uh, we in the reform movement have uh, uh, formulated our guides, uh, that uh, there should be an observance of memorial uh, to the martyrs of Nazism and a, celebra and a religious celebration of Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Um, the next major um, effort in this area is a volume um, called Gates of Mitzvah, Shari Mitzvah, uh, which I'm in the process right now of uh, revising uh, w for the reform movement. But this was a serious attempt uh, to create a guide for reform Jewish practice. Uh, now, it is important for us to note uh, that it was preceded by something called the Shabbat Manual, created by uh, Gunther Plout. And as Michael Meyer points out, um, uh, shewing both belief in God as the one who commands and the notions of mitzvot as mere uh, folkways, the Shabbat guide spoke of a God who offers an opportunity to introduce an ought into our existence, leaving open the specific role and weight of the divine and the human. Now, I, I can't argue here that this is uh, directly the influence of uh, Mordecai Kaplan, but as some of you may know, uh, that at least at one point in, our, uh, in uh, Rabbi Plout's history, he was identified with the Reconstructionist movement, and I believe that in some ways uh, he uh, tried very hard uh, to uh, return us to practice and at the same time uh, was uh, uh, cautious about how uh, to use uh, theology. Now, what is interesting in uh, the introduction uh, to uh, Gates of uh, the Seasons, which is the second volume, which is the volume I actually, um, uh, I, I actually uh, edited, uh, Shim Maslin of uh, Philadelphia uh, writes, in this book, as in Gates of Mitzvah, certain ancient practices are recommended and others are not. Um, equally important, though, is the fact that certain new practices are recommended as mitzvot, the bringing of female babies into the Brit, the observance of Yom HaShoah and Yom HaAtzma'ut come readily to mind. 
These customs of, there are customs of long standing which will have meaning and which add beauty and depth to our lives and should be observed. But as reformed Jews, we have every right to discard practice that has lost its meaning for contemporary uh, Jews and the lack of aesthetic dimension. It is our duty to study each and every tradition and on the basis of that study either to adopt or to reject. Uh, it is our duty also to find new contemporary modes of expression uh, uh, of inchoate spiritual feelings. Uh, Ellen Umansky, in a very important uh, article on Kaplan's own uh, methodology, uh, methodology for change, uh, speaks of uh, uh, five uh, aspects of change uh, which Kaplan uh, saw in the revitalization of uh, Jewish religious life. Uh, one was to uh, evaluate uh, the function of a mitzvah uh, to determine whether it ought to be uh, retained Three, whether it ought to be changed. Four, whether it was uh, whether it was obsolete and it ought to be discarded. And five, uh, whether it uh, uh, wh whether new rituals uh, were needed. Uh, the paragraph that I read to you could easily have been written uh, by Mordecai Kaplan in terms of that uh, particular uh, methodology. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Kaplan, in speaking about kashrut, uh, says once uh, these practices lose their character as um, laws and become folkways, Jews will be able to exercise better judgment as to the manner of their observance. They need not be the feeling of sin in the case of occasional uh, remissness nor self-complacency which result from scrupulous observance. From the standpoint uh, observed here, it would not be amiss for a Jew to eat freely in the house of a Gentile and to refrain from eating treif, non-Jewish food, in the house of a fellow Jew. Now, uh, as many of you know, this is a radical kind of statement. And it's a radical kind of statement, as many of you know, that uh, certain uh, conservative Jews actually de uh, developed uh, a kashrut practice where they kept kashrut at home uh, but did not keep kashrut out. Uh, but what is interesting to me in, in point of fact of this, when we wrote Gates of Mitzvah in 1974, um, we could not call uh, kashrut a mitzvah. Uh, there was a brief essay written by somebody I love, namely me, um, uh, which uh, describes the possible uh, kinds of ways one might think about kashrut and Jewish eating. Uh, it is interesting to note that about two years ago, uh, the reform movement uh, published a, a large volume uh, called The Sacred Table, uh, which provides uh, literally uh, dozens of essays uh, talking about Jewish eating. Again, I would argue from a parallel point of view, uh, Kaplan, who opens up the possibility of Jewish practice, who talks about the revitalization of Jewish life, uh, the connection uh, to the Jewish people through practice, uh, that, uh, for example, a work like The Sacred Table uh, is an extension of the kind of thought uh, that Kaplan offered uh, to us. Now, I, I want to return for a moment uh, to uh, Gates of Mitzvah, uh, which was uh, the first of our uh, guides. Uh, officially published by the reform movement. It was so radical in those days uh, that uh, we were afraid it could not get published. Uh, so we commissioned four essays by four past presidents of uh, the Central Conference of American Rabbis. I must point out four dead white males, or like only three dead white males. Uh, one is still uh, uh, alive and very well, Herman Shalman, Yibadel uh, but. Uh, Rabbi Shalman speaks about God as a mitzvah, a commander. Uh, Polish uh, speaks about God uh, as uh, the mitzvot as coming uh, directly from the experience of Jewish history. Um, Roland Gittelson, who was a religious naturalist uh, and who uh, can clearly be identified, I don't so think so much as a secret uh, uh, Ka uh, Kaplanian, uh, very much a Kaplanian, uh, writes about uh, naturalism and uh, mitzvot, and uh, although his language sometimes sounds almost uh, uh, the uh, theistic, in some ways it's a language which, uh, at least I've learned from Mel, Mel Skult, uh, uh, picks up some of the uh, complications of the language that uh, Kaplan uses. And finally, um, uh, the late Rabbi uh, Lillifeld, uh, who writes that the mitzvot in this book are mitzvot with a small m, uh, 
uh, and that the most important mitzvot are, of course, uh, ethics, uh, mitzvot bein uh, adam l'chaveiro. Uh, but again, I think, uh, first of all, it represents mitzvah uh, not as uh, something which can be defined. In fact, I would argue that in the reform movement today, uh, and if you take a look at uh, the recently uh, revised uh, Mishkan Moed, you will find that there is a new essay on mitzvot in there in which we have excerpted uh, these four essays but have, in have included the essays of large numbers of uh, younger colleagues. And what you will discover there is there is an attempt uh, to define a mitzvah in a completely pluralistic way. And I would argue if you have to do that, what has happened with the word mitzvah is it has actually, in point of fact, become a custom, a folkway, a minhag, and in point of fact, mitzvah, the word mitzvah is a metaphor, is a metaphor. And again, I would argue here, in this regard, uh, Kaplan uh, has been uh, uh, fully successful. Uh, when uh, we look at Kaplan in terms of Shabbat, he wrote, uh, the organized uh, religions of uh, mankind represent the determination of important historic groups to serve as the bearers of salvation for their people. This explains the place that religion holds in Jewish life. It represents the powerful effort of the Jewish people to make the experience of Jewish group life in the past and present and future an instrument for salvation. Uh, the Jew was particularly aware of Judaism's functioning in this manner on the Sabbath. On this day, he uh, was liberated from the distracting cares of the week, and he participated in the religious activities that renewed his faith in the ideals which gave worth and dignity to human life. He felt it was good to be alive and good to be a Jew. Uh, if you take a look again at uh, uh, Mishkan Moed, or uh, previously uh, Sha'are Moed, uh, what you will discover is uh, that there is an attempt to recover Shabbat as a way of uh, reflecting on how a Jew would put together a meaningful Shabbat. And especially in the area of work and rest, uh, one uh, discovers that uh, the observance of Shabbat is not to become a burden, but the observance of Shabbat is to become a time of joy. So instead of having uh, prescriptions about what one can do and what one cannot do, what one has is a kind of uh, uh, elaborate discussion in the back of the book uh, of uh, possible ways, and a, con and a hermeneutic which uses the concepts of kedusha, holiness, oneg, uh, uh, delight, and menucha as uh, rest, uh, and asks that in some sense the individual Jew judge that which they do uh, in terms of uh, uh, of those uh, three concepts. Uh, there's a lot more that I would love to say, but my time is up. But I want to suggest that in one way, Kaplan has won the day in the reform movement. And he's won the day in the reform movement of helping us to restore uh, Jewish peoplehood, a serious notion of the revitalization of Jewish practice. I think in the area where Kaplan has lost, and I think this is not only Kaplan, but I think uh, those of uh, uh, those of our theologians of the 20th century uh, who uh, believed in, in intellectual reg rigor, uh, such as uh, my uh, teacher, Jean Borowitz, and others, um, that in point of fact, we are at a period of time uh, where uh, Jews, at least the Jew in the pew, uh, as the pew uh, study suggests, um, sorry about that, I just, I just heard a lecture on are you pewish, um, but, uh, but that the Jews are, are, are looking for a meaningful experience, and they are not less necessarily looking for a uh, theological rationale. Uh, Michael Morgan, a uh, uh, good friend of uh, David Ellenson's and a very important uh, Jewish thinker, wrote a little book called Interim Judaism. He suggests that the ideologies and the theologies and the philosophies of Judaism of the uh, 20th century have all run their course. Uh, that we're now in an interim period where Jews are doing a lot of Jewish things, but there is no rationale. So the question is, uh, a la Kaplan, can we recreate some way of talking about Jewish practice in a coherent manner uh, that will lead to a better Jewish future? Great. Great talk. You, you take your question. Oh, you're done? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you for a wonderful uh, discussion. Questions?
I mean in writing, not remember I was in writing. <laughs> Sorry, I slipped. <clears throat> Just gonna check my multiple devices here. Okay. So I'll start with uh, one the old-fashioned way. For Chancellor Ellenson, you referred to yourself as an unreconstructed reconstructionist. <laughs> On another occasion, you referred to yourself as an orthodox reconstructionist with a small o. Could you say a few more words about what you mean? <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Uh, I am probably still one of those people who, uh, in part, still lives in the 20th century. Uh, I think on a personal level, um, I had grown up, I would say, in something of a thick Jewish culture. I grew up uh, in an Orthodox home and community, uh, received that kind of education. I think the remarks that actually all the panelists made here, and certainly, uh, Peter, when you concluded about where it is that, in quotes, Kaplan triumphed in reform in terms of taking tradition seriously, the notion of Jewish peoplehood. A number of years ago, Emil Fackenheim wrote a piece, basically what I learned from Mordechai Kaplan. And he said, because I would suspect, Rachel, if you looked at Fackenheim's writings in the 60s, they would probably parallel, in terms of his views of Kaplan's theology, what Dr. Borowitz wrote. Um, said what he had really learned was that Kaplan was right about one basic fact, the primacy of Jewish peoplehood all along. Uh, on a personal level, I suppose when I use the term orthodox with a small o or unreconstructed uh, reconstructionist, uh, I still believe in uh, naturalism, not supernaturalism. Uh, in regard to uh, theology, it's been interesting for me this semester, I'm co-teaching a course with our teacher, Eugene Borowitz, uh, and he and I really have very different views of, uh, of God. In fact, he, I guess I can reveal this, he ended class the other day and said, now, why did you become a rabbi? Uh, <laughs> and I, um, I think he said it positively to me. I'll have to, uh, have to check later, but, uh, I have unbelievable admiration for Mordecai Kaplan. I like to think that uh, the attachments that I've displayed uh, in my own life and in my work have been a reflection of the influence that uh, Rabbi Kaplan had upon me. And uh, the only critique, I guess I would say, is that when Kaplan lived, one probably did not have to reflect upon issues of Jewish peoplehood in quite the way that one might in a 21st century context. I mean, basically when Rabbi Waxman spoke at the end today, and your remarks, Deborah, uh, and actually all the people were on the previous panels, uh, the social situation of Jews in America is not in 2014 what it was in the 20s and 30s, 40s, 50s, and even for someone like myself. Uh, I still grew up in a world where my father would say, belonging to a shul, keeping kosher, giving a contribution to the United Jewish Appeal, my father would always say, that's just the tax I pay for being a Jew. To ask my father, why be Jewish, would be like asking, why did you elect to breathe? Uh, and I think that was transmitted to me in very significant ways. My children, who are all graduates of Jewish day schools, I think have not internalized, I'm gonna now call it, I don't think in a negative way, the tribal ethos that I inherited. Um, I say that positively, and I think these are challenges that we confront today, and I'm, uh, very, very happy that people like Rabbi Waxman and Rabbi Aaron Pankin can lead us and our people in trying to answer them as we move on in the 21st century. Thanks. Uh, this is for uh, Rabbi Dr. Sabbath Beit Halachmi. Um, I, I'm having trouble with the handwriting, but I'm gonna do my best. People have used a covenantal God to, to, kill, um, to, to kill, to maim, to steal, or to call them, I should say, to kill, to maim, and to steal, among other horrible things. Why uh, would Borowitz's conception be less mediated by the personality than would Kaplan's theological conception at the end of the day, in your view? 
Just a small question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, well, I think it's any, about any theology you could ask that question, right? All theologies uh, that I can think of have actually been used for both uh, very positive and potentially very uh, negative and dangerous uh, and even evil ways as, as we see uh, all over the world, both throughout history and today. I, what's fascinating about Borowitz's use of that term is that he was actually accused of taking that term from Christian theology, the term it turns out was in fact previously used before 1961 by Puritan pilgrims in the 17th century. He's quite certain and makes a very vehement argument that he did not take it from there. Um, however, he was searching, and he writes a lot about this, he was searching for the right term that would give an absolute commandedness and determine that he was speaking about a God that was commanding, but not in the traditional sense of Heschel's God. And yet that was very much uh, affirmative of the self, but not as much as Kaplan. And so that's how he comes to this covenantal understanding that actually it's, that there should be a clear role for the individual, but it's clear that there's a junior, as he puts it, a junior and a senior partner in this covenant, but certainly throughout history, it comes obviously originally from the Bible. Throughout history, it has the idea of covenant has been used in, in every way. And what Borowitz was trying to do, and what I, I think is still very present, I want to maybe push a few of us on this, very present in the reform movement, is this sense that there is a very clearly, uh, a clear sense of God's commanding presence in our lives. And I think in that way, I would say, I would actually, uh, to some degree, say that there is a wide spectrum of theologies that are alive and well amongst our colleagues and amongst uh, our thinkers in the movement. And they very much range, uh, I would say, the gamut between Kaplan and Heschel with really Borowitz and his theology and having trained a couple of generations. Uh, of our clergy that Borowitz is very much in the center. As someone who is my primary role today is as the National Director of Recruitment and Admissions for the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, which, as one of my colleagues says, put, gives me a front seat in terms of encountering and reading what the theologies of our, uh, of our current uh, students and our current applicants uh, really is. And I would say there very much is present in their essays about God a range between Heschel and Kaplan, with peoplehood being even more primary than a commitment to Israel. There's a commitment to Jewish peoplehood, which we've spoken about. And fascinating to me is that the, the, in terms of God and understanding their theologies, they absolutely span the spectrum uh, between Heschel and Kaplan with Borowitz, Borowitz very much at the center. And obviously, most of our applicants, not all, but most of our applicants are very much products of reform rabbis of the last, their theologies are very much the product of uh, the rabbis of our last several generations. So I would say there's a deep pluralism of an understanding of covenantal theology today. Great. Did you want to? The, uh, before we go on with questions, uh, the RRC would like everyone to know uh, that the Reconstructionist archives there have many letters um, uh, to Kaplan and some of Kaplan's responses, and they're very, maybe many of them very relevant to discussions of this panel and others today. And, the RRC is looking forward to sharing those with interested folks. Just, just one word, sure. I mean, in addition to what you've said, certainly from Dr. Bordowitz's lectures, uh, in terms of what one might call the limits that would be placed on the activities in which Jews would participate, he often in public lectures, and you would know far better than I in his writings, because I don't see it as much, cites Rabbi Leo Beck. Uh, Beck, you'll note, and you'll remember, focused or said that Judaism had two axes. There's geheimness, mystery, und Gebot, and commandment. And Beck, certainly as a German, who moved towards writing a book, This People Israel, which reflects elements, I think, after his Holocaust experience, uh, that echoes some of the insights for different reasons that uh, Rabbi Kaplan put forth. Uh, Dr. Borowitz often commented in class and in many situations that in Judaism there is always, in quotes, the ethical imperative that uh, the gabot of Leo Beck that always keeps, in quotes, 
the geheimness or mystery, the irrationality of what a God belief might be uh, intact. I'm not sure that that's empirically verifiable, but this at least is a position that I've heard Borowitz put forth. So I have to add to that that 20 years ago, I'm sorry that you weren't teaching on the New York campus then, David, but uh, 20 years ago I spent a couple of summers asking each professor of the Hebrew Union College on the New York campus to tell me what were the two most influential books for them in terms of their thinking. Uh, and for Borowitz it was Beck's This People Israel and Buber's Moses. Uh, and I think actually you can see his theology very much, as you said, as a product. Next question uh, for, uh, again, for um, Rabbi Dr. B Sabbath Beit Halachmi. Sorry, I'm trying to be formal. Sorry, in the early, uh, let's say, but I don't want to start getting into first name issues. In the early 60s, I registered for a course with Professor Borowitz at JIR. He stated unequivocally, unequivocally that no one under the age of 50 believed there was such a thing as the Jewish people. What do you think changed his mind? Was it Kaplan's influence? And you touched on this maybe a little bit earlier. What year was that, 19? Early 60s. A fascinating question. Um, I think that a number of issues really changed his mind. I think his Zionism and his understanding of Kaplan uh, deepened along the way, uh, but it's a, it's a fascinating question to, to trace. Um, this is interesting. It's, it begins, a reconstructionist conservative reconciliation failed. I'm not sure what this is referring to specifically. Let's assume it did. Um, could there be a reconstructionist reform, um, conciliation, af affiliation, confederation? Anybody who wants to. Uh, since I'm, since I'm non-institutional, non <laughs> um, I believe two things. One, people tend not to vote themselves out of business. <laughs> uh, is that a matter of faith? That's a, ma that's a matter of empirical uh, judgment. Um, just think about the March of Dimes and uh, the cure of uh, infantile paralysis. On the other hand, uh, I would argue that an American Judaism has emerged. It has been emerging now for a fairly long period of time. I would also argue uh, that, uh, by and large, uh, we are in a non-ideological age, that each of uh, the three, or maybe four, depending on how you want to see it, non-orthodox movements uh, have uh, many commonalities is, and is certain differences. Is the fourth renewal or humanism or something else? What? Is the fourth, fourth re renewal. renewal or yeah, something renewal. else? Yeah, renewal. And uh, so that it is at least conceivable in a world which is probably going to have greater scarcity uh, that we will see uh, the greater cooperation of institutions. Uh, under uh, my friend and teacher, uh, Rabbi David Ellenson, uh, the uh, Jewish Theological Seminary and the Hebrew Union College have done uh, significant work together. Uh, it would be my hope that uh, the new young leaders of uh, uh, our movements uh, would consider uh, perhaps a tripartite or uh, a four-part uh, sense of cooperation uh, because I think we're in a period of time when that would be of great benefit to all of us. Uh, I would not like to lose the creativity that comes uh, from our movements, but I think it could be done in a, uh, in a kind of uh, um, uh, almost a smorgasbord approach where you could uh, uh, have a variety of, of services, you could learn from a variety of teachers, and uh, one of the things that is exciting to me is uh, to think about that possibility. Uh, yeah, I would like to respond to uh, two parts of this. Um, when asked uh, what was the basic problem with Judaism in America, uh, Isaac Mayer Wise, the brick and mortar uh, founder of the reform movement back in the 1870s, said the Parnas, by which he meant the president of the congregation, by which he meant uh, founders of congregations in their own image. Uh, so we have a, a history, a long history of institutionalism uh, that I think is uh, only partly connected to uh, ideology, that we have deep uh, vested interests in institutional structures and denominational structures. I think the bigger question of reform uh, 
reconstructionist uh, amalgamation is conservative reconstructionist, and why during the early 60s um, uh, did, it didn't work out differently, I think it's called a pension fund. I think there were very practical reasons uh, as to why this, doesn't, uh, the, why this doesn't concern. I think at the level of ideology, perhaps at the level of training, uh, not a problem. Uh, we have a model going at our synagogue now where uh, our structure is too big for our current population. Uh, our, our end of the building is reform. At the other end, in a smaller auditorium, is a conservative synagogue. They're renting from us. And I think you're going to see a lot of contraction uh, along those lines. It's not just demographic, it's financial, uh, and it's a question of how much is it worth to be Jewish in America? It's a very expensive uh, proposition to say the least. And there is a big question as to what is the institutional embodiment of all of our different ideologies of Judaism and are people going to be willing to pay for them? We have separation of church and state and so you have to pay to pray here in America. Uh, secondly, uh, I think there's a world of difference between the concept of American Judaism and Judaism or Judaisms in America. Again, going back to Isaac Mayer Wise, uh, he uh, edited his own prayer book, which he called Minhag America in 1855. That same year, a group of, uh, of rabbis and rabbinic leaders from across the then spectrum in American Judaism met in Cleveland, and the meeting blew up. Uh, just at the moment when somebody dared to put forward a Minhag America, it just simply didn't work and there has never been that big umbrella over uh, all of us ever uh, since. So I think what we need to look for and hopefully will do, and I think there are indications, is to for the least the time being keep institutional identity uh, as is but find much more significant, much deeper significant ways of cooperation and uh, cross-fertilization. Okay. Um, I, I did want to respond by noting three, I think, significant observations that might uh, together constitute a very positive response to this question. One is amongst our applicants. We're asking them their theologies, they're interpreting a Torah portion, and we're asking them about Reform Judaism uh, as part of a major, major application process. In their theologies, as I said, I see that spectrum. Even when we ask them about their Reform Judaism, there is um, almost always a definition of Reform Judaism, which certainly is linked, or one could see is linked uh, to other possibilities of other denominations as well, meaning they are the product of very much what, how you began. Uh, we live in a world of ortho various types of Orthodox Judaism and non-Orthodox Judaism. Dr. Borowitz's books, in fact, are always geared toward not just to the reform movement, but to non-Orthodox Judaism, that really the line of, a, of an absolute traditional halachic observance versus non is really the only line that's significant in American Jewish life today. So in that sense, very much I, I, I agree with him. Um, the second is that when I, I've been traveling a great deal over the last number of months and in one of the largest reform synagogues, um, the rabbi actually spoke with me about wanting to make his very classical, uh, one of the largest synagogues, more Kaplanian. That's two. Um, and three, when I think about uh, um, the collection of essays, uh, Elliot, Rabbi Dr. Elliot Cosgrove, in, your, in the book you edited, uh, New Theologies, those essays, although they represent rabbis uh, and thinkers from across the de denominational lines, I think there's a very, very clear shared sense, I, I don't know if you agree or not, but shared sense of theological sensibilities. And so I think there's a lot of joint intellectual work to be done together. Uh, we can get in a couple more questions if there's nothing more on, on this right now, big subject, so I'll go on. What exactly does it, just shifting gears, what exactly does it say about us and American Judaism more generally? that so much of our study of Kaplan revolves around how to distinguish his conception of God from that of Heschel or Borowitz, Steinberg, or various other people. Anybody have any ideas? I, we touched on this maybe we at the end in terms of the lot. lack of... Yeah, yeah. You know, so. right. yes. We may be in an interim <laughs> period of non-theology or, or something, something else. Last question is, um, 
uh, back to the history of this interaction, um, my uh, recollection is that uh, uh, Rabbi Rowan Gittleson, who's been referred to many times, sometime probably in the late 50s or early 60s, wrote an open letter to Kaplan, I think. Uh, someone along the lines of saying, you won, uh, please stop beating us up uh, now. <laughs> you keep doing it. Um, does this ring a bell? Does anybody have any thoughts? Was Kaplan unfair in his continuing critique of the reform movement? The way I'd respond to it, it isn't even so much with the reform movement. I had lunch on uh, Friday with Arnie Eisen. We were talking about reform, but also other issues. And certainly, there are many people here who could speak to this. The reality is that uh, when Kaplan spoke about reform, almost always it was the Pittsburgh Platform of 1885, Kaufman Kohler, uh, a Geiger of a certain type. In other words, reform for him in his writing really never changed. You would never have known Columbus. You wouldn't have known David Polish, Roland Gittleson, the overwhelming impact well, he, he had on the... I mean, no, no, no. When I know, I'm, I'm now talking about his writings. Yeah, yeah. No, no, of course he knew them. The point I want to make is that in his writing, you would never see <coughs> this kind of evolution. But in talking to Arnie about it, the reality is that Kaplan was already and you know, here Mel could really speak with much greater authority. He was already 53, 54, when he wrote Judaism as a Civilization. The reality is, while there were evolution, uh, was some degree of evolution and change, I love that Zachary pointed out the cyborgs today. <laughs> I uh, will confess I had not noted that before. Uh, the reality is, someone mentioned, well, he never really wrote about the Holocaust, the issue of evil. Arthur Cohen, in his Natural and Supernatural Jew, points out uh, Kaplan never really dealt in significant ways with evil, or to phrase it differently, to phrase it differently, it isn't like his writings evolved significantly on this issue uh, as a result of having witnessed, let's say, these catastrophic events of the, uh, of the 20th century, uh, so that it interested me that, or it does interest me, that yes, I would contend that after a while there's a caricature of reform that continues to emerge, but there are caricatures or of, of other types that continue in his writing. And I think it may just be that you had someone who was pretty old, middle-aged, I'm 66 now, uh, <laughs> when, when he began to write his most mature works. And it may just be that it didn't fit into a certain kind of uh, nimbleness that might have otherwise emerged. And in this sense, I do think a paper or a book, and I look to Mel to write this, is that uh, what Mel Skult has done is, because you have had access to his diaries, you see a Mordecai Kaplan in all of his complexities with all of his thoughts and you present them to us. But if one is confined to his canon and doesn't have all of these diaries, you would not know that Kaplan believed about certain things, elements that you've displayed. And the question then that emerges <coughs> is when someone writes privately in his diary or has private correspondence, but does not make public proclamations or declarations, in quotes, who, who is the real Mordecai Kaplan? And that, that is probably worth thinking about with any thinker. And then you would ask the question, why didn't Kaplan, in his written works, display the ki same kind of subtlety and understanding that he certainly had about the reality in this particular instance, the reform movement? I'm going to give our chair the last word. Uh, on the question, did Kaplan win? Um, I would say that if Kaplan had won, then the reform movement in Judaism also would have won, and Judaism in America would have won. But the fact of the matter is, if you look broadly across the American Jewish community, reform didn't win, Kaplan didn't win, and conservative didn't win. Uh, my teacher, Dr. Marcus, described the religion of Jews in colonial America as the orthodoxy of salutary neglect. <laughs> and it is the orthodoxy of salutary neglect 
which truly has triumphed in the American Jewish community. And that's why we need thinkers like Kaplan and to reconsider Kaplan to try to figure out what can be done to move them from Jews who, in an orthodox way, neglect acting out their Jewishness and find a way to engage tradition and community in a creative and meaningful fashion. Great.